Hi, my name is Maya Heimann and I'm a trained gardener with a degree in anthropological agriculture. Welcome to the third lecture on regenerative vegetable production. I'm excited to provide an overview of, as well as delve into two systems demonstrating how regenerative principles can be integrated into vegetable production. Here we will draw on two examples from the Schloss Tempelhof farm. After watching this lecture, you will have learned about what defines regenerative vegetable production, the four principles of regenerative vegetable production, practical tools and cultivation methods for improving and maintaining the soil food web in vegetable production, and tools and techniques for regenerative vegetable production. In lesson one, Reg Ag in Practice, we will look at mulch vegetable system, the mulch vegetable system at Schloss Tempelhof. Here, there are a number of step, steps which we will look into, including aeration and the loosening of soil, the stabilizing of soil structure using winter cover crops, shallow cultivation, covering the soil with mulch, and lastly, direct planting into the mulch layer. Lesson two, reg ag in practice, will be no-till covered production. Here we will look at the steps of maximizing soil stabilization using living plants, minimal soil disturbance, and keeping the ground covered with silage transfer mulch. I'd like to start with a brief review of the soil food web. As we have learned from previous lectures, the soil food web is the community of organisms living all or part of their lives in the soil. It describes a complex living system in the soil and how it interacts with the environment, plants, and animals. Thus, our soil food web is an infinitely important resource and improving and maintaining its health is the foundation of regenerative agriculture. Due to the intensity, Annual vegetable production is typically very stressful for our soil food web. It typically requires massive soil disturbance in the form of tillage and weed control, as well as high nutrient inputs. So how can vegetable production be done regeneratively? Let's look at the four principles of regenerative agriculture that are relevant for vegetable production. The first is to disturb the soil as little as necessary. The second is to keep the soil covered as often as possible. The third is to keep living roots in the soil as long and as frequent as possible. The goal is to maximize photosynthesis and thereby root exudates. Lastly, we want to grow the largest possible diversity of plants. Above ground plant diversity is directly linked to below ground plant diversity. Studies show that plant diversity provide a variety of food to soil microorganisms, promoting soil microorganism diversity. A diverse soil microorganism population increases the diversity of the plant available nutrient pools, which in turn promote plant diversity. How to improve and maintain the soil food web in vegetable production. According to Dr. Elaine R. Ingham, as written on the United States Department of Agriculture website. Intensive tillage triggers spurts of activity among bacteria and other organisms that consume organic matter and convert it into CO2, depleting the active fraction first. Practices that build soil organic matter, reduce tillage and regular additions of organic material, will raise the proportion of, act of active organic matter long before increases in total organic matter can be measured. As soil organic matter levels rise, soil organisms play a role in its conversion to humus, a relatively stable form of carbon sequestration in soils for decades or even centuries. Soil organic matter is the storehouse for energy and nutrients used by plants and other organisms. Bacteria, fungi, and other soil dwellers transform and release nutrients from organic matter. These micro-shedders, immature orbit mites, skeletonize plant leaves. This starts the nutrient cycling of carbon, nitrogen, and other elements." End quote. So with an effort to maintain a diversity of living roots in the ground and mulching as often as possible, 
annual agriculture can mimic the inherent health of perennial systems. Thus, keeping the soil covered and working with layers of cover is key. But how to keep the soil covered while growing annual crops often poses a challenge. One best practice for doing this on a larger scale is the implementation of a tractor mulch system. On the Schloss Tempelhof farm, for all of the long-standing transplanted field crops, such as cabbage, celeric, leeks, pumpkins, and potatoes, they are mulched to keep the ground covered for the duration of the crop growing season. The mulch cover not only provides a desirable habitat for microorganisms, keeping the soil dark and moist, but it also significantly reduces evaporation and erosion potential while increasing yields and crop health. The FORAN project, which stands for the Improvement of Organic Crop Rotations with Transfer Mulch for Regenerative and Adapted Nutrient Management, initiated from the University of Kassel, they focus on developing soil regenerating practices that can be integrated into crop rotations. As part of the Foran project data from three, far data from three farms, including Schloss Tempelhof, was gathered to compare yields and soil health under different potato production systems. Hereby, plots of farm standard potato growing techniques were compared with plots of regenerative potato growing techniques. The first year results showed how across three farms, the average yield of marketable potatoes can be increased through minimal tillage, cover cropping, and the use of mulch. Given the factors such as soil health improvement and erosion mitigation, among many others, these preliminary findings are exciting as they show that regenerative agriculture has the potential to increase yields while building better soils. According to the paper, Modern Concepts of Soil Conservation, quote, the mulch layer creates a stable microbial ecology and environment for biological activity and insulates the soil from temperature extremes and rapid desiccation. The microbial and macrofaunal earthworm populations become more like those of natural soils. Their activity greatly enhances the assimilation and transfer of surface organic mulches into deeper soil levels, and in the process creating physically robust channels to enhance water penetration and dispersion into the soil." End quote. The increase in earthworm populations, which is an important factor in determining overall soil health, has been shown in several studies to greatly increase in mulch soils. In the following lesson, we will take a look at the practical tools and techniques for regenerative vegetable production. Welcome to lesson one, reg ag in practice. Here we will look at a mulch vegetable system as implemented on the farm Schloss Tempelhof. In order to address the widespread lack of ground cover in vegetable production for long periods of the year, we at Schloss Tempelhof developed a unique vegetable mulch system. Mulch not only addresses the issue of ground cover, but also reduces irrigation needs, particularly important with increasing climate change, while also increasing yields, crop, and soil health. Almost all of our 2.5 hectare field vegetable beds go into the winter covered. In mid-September to the end of October, we sow a mixture of winter rye with 20% winter peas and 10% vetch, using a seed rate of approximately 250 kilograms per hectare. We sow using a very low-tech handheld disc spreader and simply walking over our beds. On a larger scale, a tractor-driven seed drill can be used for sowing the winter cover crop. Let us get an overview of the steps that we're going to look into. The first step is going to be aeration and loosening the soil. The second step is going to be stabilizing soil structure using winter cover crops, as I just described. The third step will be shallow cultivation. The fourth, the fourth step will be covering the soil with mulch. And the final step is going to be planting directly into the mulch layer. So step one, aeration or loosening the soil. The first, this is the first step. 
We perform this task in the fall, since with our heavy soils, our springs are often too moist for working. Aeration reduces soil compaction by forming air pockets, which allow for the movement of water, air, and nutrients to the root zone, keeping the soils healthy. This helps the roots grow deeper while producing stronger and more vigorous crops. To do this while minimizing soil disturbance, we use a chisel plow or key lime plow. For our 120 centimeter bed width, we set three shanks at a distance of 40 centimeters on which we pull, which we pull through our beds in September, just before sowing the winter cover crop. Our goal here is not to go as deep as mechanically possible, but rather just under the first layer of compaction, which in our case is usually around 20 to 25 centimeters. The second step is stabilizing the soil using winter cover crops. Because we want the effect of our soil aeration and loosening to remain, it's crucial to biologically stabilize the mechanically loosened soil as soon as possible using living roots. Living roots from, for example, a cover crop will thrive and grow into the loosened soil and prevent further compaction and soil erosion. In our climate, with winters where the temperatures occasionally drop to minus 20 degrees Celsius for short periods of the year, but can remain at minus 15 degrees Celsius for over a week, Winter rye has proven to be one of the only crops that can survive these harsh winter conditions. Even a rye sown in November, after the last vegetable crop has been harvested, still, still provides a light soil cover. In warmer climates, more diverse cover crops should be used to promote winter coverage while encouraging a higher diversity of plants. The third step is shallow cultivation. By the end of April, the rye has taken on a length of 20 to 50 centimeters. So to prepare for the mulch plantings with minimal soil disturbance, we flail mow the cover crop and till in the remains and only the very top layer, tilling at a depth of five to eight centimeters. Our rotary tiller has knives that are set at a 90 degree angle to precisely be able to undercut the stand. We use support wheels to make sure that we are not cultivating deeper than necessary. The goal here is to incorporate the biomass of the cover crop into our soil so that contact between plant matter and soil occur. This prevents the nutrients from the cover crop escaping into our atmosphere in gas form. In order to retain the maximal amount of nutrients and thus build humus, the plant matter should directly be mixed with biologically active topsoil. The combination of organic fragments, plant rests, with inorganic particles such as clay minerals create what are called the clay humus complexes. These complexes stabilize the soil against erosion, create favorable conditions for the air and water balance, and in, the poor volume of the so and in the poor volume of the soil, and thus help increase soil fertility. Picking the right mulch material. There are three main factors to consider when choosing mulch material. The first is the carbon to, na to nitrogen ratio. The second is the structure. And the third is the nutrient content. The carbon to nitrogen ratio varies greatly and is influenced by the materials as well as the age of the material. Materials with a 15 nitrogen to carbon ratio will tend to decompose quickly and become compacted. One example of this would be a young and legume rich material. Materials with about 15 to 30 uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio are considered ideal. These would be grass clover mixtures um, at, at the silage harvest point or a winter rye vetch mixture. Materials with over 30 nitrogen to carbon ratios tend to have a very slow decomp decomposition with also potential for nitrogen immobilization. These would be things like straw or old cereals. The structure is influenced by cutting length and crop stage. Example of a material that is too young 
materials that are too young and short often lead to compaction and anaerobic conditions. For this reason, crop mixtures, where some crops have higher nitrogen ratios and others have higher carbon ratios, are often ideal. Nutrient content. Mulch nutrient content should be taken into account in fertilization calculation. Between 20 to 40% of nitrogen becomes plant available in the short term, depending on the material used. Phosphorus and potassium inputs from the addition of mulch material can also be substantial in short as well as long term. The following chart taken from the Green Resilient Fact Sheet, Transfer Mulch in Organic Greenhouses, provides a good overview of the various materials and their properties. In our climate, many of our field vegetable crops are planted in May. A few days before planting, we mow and harvest our pasture grass or cover crop. For example, a mixture of rye, alfalfa, red clover, and pea. Plantings earlier than mid-April could have negative effects from being planted in a mulch layer in cold nights, due to the cold nights. Soil under mulch does not warm up as fast as bare soil, and at nighttime, the radiation of warmth from open soil can protect plantings from light frosts. This is especially important to watch out for in very early summer squash plantings or onions, as we have lost a few crops due to mulching. Another key issue to keep in mind is to use seed-free mulch material. Pastures cut in mid-May can already contain enough weed seeds to create a huge problem for weed management. Um, and this, we're gonna look into this topic of weed management and mulch systems later on. Once the material is cut, we load it up using our feed wagon. We drive over our prepared beds on permanently established living green pathways and spread the mulch material as even as possible on the beds using the attached dosing rollers. The green pathways furthermore help reduce compaction on our beds when we drive with heavy machinery. We often follow the bed using a hay fork to distribute any larger piles of material. Our goal is to find the right mulch depth to be an effective weed suppressant while still compatible with our planting technology. In warmer and wetter climates, where the decomposition rate is faster, a larger mulch layer will be needed for successful weed suppression to, for the entire crop duration. For us, we use a layer of 12 to 15 centimeters of mulch. This adds up to being around 15 to 20 tons of dry matter per hectare, and an average total nutrient input of 200 to 300 kilograms M per hectare. Of course, depending on the mulch, the, of course, this very varies and depends on the mulch type. Again, to review, as we have seen from the chart before, the fertilization properties of mulch material depend on the type of material, the age, the length, and the quantity that are used. Once the bed has been covered with a layer of mulch, we drive over the mulched beds with our mulch planting machine. Using the knife to cut through the mulch layer, the shank behind the knife slits open the soil below where the plants are directly set into. The wheels then press the soil and mulch material back around the plants, ensuring good root to soil contact. Pressing the mulch material back towards the plant is essential for ensuring weed suppression in the planting row. For a visual, let's take a look at the short video showing the steps that we just described. Here the material is being loaded up into the feed wagon. This material in this case is a silage mulch, but can also just be a cut pasture. And the feed wagon drives directly over the bed on permanent green pathways and spreads the mulch material as evenly as possible. Two people follow up using rakes to further kind of spread out the mulch so that there is no large uh, clumps. The mulch machine, planting machine is attached and the planters then are directly driving over the mulched bed and planting directly in. Um, as we can see here, there is a slit where uh, an opening is there for then the planter to place the plant into the bed. And following that, there are two wheels which help push back the um, soil and plant material, the mulch plant material, uh, cover, making sure that weed suppression directly around the plant is secured. Here we can see uh, both planted and unplanted mulched beds. 
and with a very fine result. Once a successful mulch planting has taken place, there's little to no cultivation necessary for the rest of the growing duration. Important to take into account is that mulch only effectively suppresses annual weeds. Perennial weeds such as thistle, dandelion, crab, crab grass, and many others need to be restricted through cultivation and or a fitting crop rotation as preparation for a vegetable mulch system. In our climate, storage vegetables are harvested between mid-September and mid-November. Ideally, the remaining mulch residues after harvest are minimal, but this can vary depending on rain and warmth rates during the season. After harvest, we flail mow all of the plant rests and the mulch residues, thus speeding up the decomposition process. We then seed our winter cover crop and shallowly till to minimize any weeds and promote germination. This final, this final shallow tillage further ensures that the decomposition of leftover plant residues and mulch materials takes place such that the winter cover crop can establish and the beds are ready for the following crop cycle the next spring. Once the cash crop has been harvested, the at this point decomposing mulch layer and crop residues together with the rye and vetch winter cover crop are worked shallowly about four to six centimeters into the soil. Mulching together with minimal soil disturb, disruption and maximal living roots is a tool with significant potential for regenerating soils. Mulching together with minimal soil disruption and maximal living roots is a tool with significant potential for regenerating our soils. To make use of all these beneficial effects of the mulch system in vegetable production and still deliver high quality products with high yields, there are a few things that need to be taken into consideration. So let's summarize. Some of the practical issues to consider before implementing such a system are that the system if to be done on scale, does require farm scale equipment to avoid high labor costs. If implemented in a similar fashion, um, as we have just shown on the Schloss Tempelhof farm, it's important to start with crops that have a long uh, maturity duration. If implemented in a similar fashion to how we just talked about, then we do want to start with crops that have long DTMs, days to maturity. So crops that are going to stay on the field for a longer period of time so that the input of mulching is really worth it. We're also going to pick out crops that have uh, relatively high nutrient uptake demands. And the last one is crops that have high water demands um, make sense to integrate into mulch systems as the mulching in itself has a profound effect on water household. As we have seen from the previous example, a mulch vegetable system provides multiple options for practical implementation from four of the main principles of regenerative agriculture. As the tractor mulch system, as done in Schloss Tempelhof, has shown, this is an option for integrating these four main principles of regenerative agriculture into vegetable production systems. Research shows that these principles of regenerative agriculture have a great effect on soil structure, soil life, organic matter content, yield, and plant health. According to one research article, mulch, quote, increases the soil nutrient, maintains the optimum soil temperature, restricts the rate of evaporation from the soil surface, restricts weed growth, and prevents soil erosion. It also helps to improve the soil health. Organic mulches are cheap materials, therefore the cost of mulching is also economical." End quote. Thank you for watching this lesson.